Hello all and welcome to another episode of the AABIP podcasts. We have episode 49 now and uh, we are very fortunate on this episode to be joined by Ehab Bedavi. Ehab is a respiratory consultant at Sheffield and uh, is a rapidly you know, growing and prominent name in the plural world, whom I'm very excited to have with me here on the podcast. With Ehab, we're going to discuss really a UK-based approach to pleuroscopy predominantly. So Ehab, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. This is a pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. You know, just let's get started with a few general questions about your plural service and, and how it works at Oxford, where you trained and at Sheffield, where you are right now. So what does a plural service constitute? Great. Thank you. I think that's a great start. So um, basically, the the way we run the service in, in Sheffield is, is, is very similar to how um, we run it uh, or the service that I worked with when I was in, in Oxford. And essentially, um, the patients can either be referred to us um, as an outpatient from um, GPs, either picking up uh, pleural effusions, um, a unilateral pleural effusion on a, as an incidental finding on a chest X-ray, um, or, uh, for example, somebody uh, gets a CT scan, which shows an incidental uh, pleural effusion, um, and then that gets flagged to us, or obviously patients um, present to uh, the emergency department with breathlessness, and then the pleural effusion is, is picked up um, there um, and then obviously we we uh, gets flagged up and then we we approach it uh, we take it from there so uh, essentially our uh, our service involves first of all um, seeing the patient as what we call a most of us now use this term one-stop shop um, I'm not sure if you use a similar uh, term in the US but essentially what it uh, what it entails is us arranging, obviously, to see the patient, to take a history, to examine, to assess them, um, the chronology of the of the symptoms, conduct an ultrasound scan, and um, where appropriate, uh, we would do a, an initial uh, diagnostic um, aspirate, usually combined with a therapeutic aspiration. Um, and then, uh, obviously, if there hasn't been any cross-sectional imaging, we would normally conduct a CT um, scan as well. Um, and then, basically, depending on what the, the pretest probability of malignancy or suspected differential at that point, um, we would then take that further um, after that and usually see them back in the plural clinic with the results um, to then take the next step or refer them directly to the um, plural MDT or in some cases the plural MDT is merged with the lung cancer MDT in some hospitals um, for discussion of their radiology and site, initial cytology findings etc. Um, in terms of personnel the plural services is usually um, uh, encompasses a plural uh, consultant um, as a lead. Um, there may be one or two or in such as where we in, in Sheffield here as we're quite a big center, we have three um, plural consultants. And um, then we'll have a, a plural specialist nurse. Um, there may be a plural uh, fellow. Um, and uh, usually we, we, we work obviously in a close, um, we have a close working relationship with, with our lung cancer um, colleagues as well. And what about the inpatient side? How do you all manage patients on the inpatient? Do you all have a primary service or is it all consultant based? Yeah, so so you, in in big uh, sort of teaching academic um, uh, sort of academic plural centers, for example, like Oxford and and Bristol, so they have dedicated plural fellows who are usually there doing research, um, plural research, and then also support the clinical plural service. So they may be the first port of call to address those um, with with centers where where we're still sort of early developing our our, our plural academia, such as Sheffield or other centers that do not take part in plural academia, usually they will go via the um, respiratory registrar or um, uh, fellow, as I call them, um, on your side of the uh, pond. Um, and uh, they will sort of be the first point of assessment, and then they would flag them up to the plural consultant. Um, and then usually any sort of procedural diagnostic side would be, would be, would be consultant-led, yes. And you mentioned plural MDT. So who all participate in this MDT and uh, how often do you all meet? <laughs> 
Yep. So um, the plural uh, MDT uh, usually runs either once a week or once a fortnight. Um, so here we run it once a fortnight. In, in, in Oxford, we used to run it once a week. That would usually be comprised of the plural consultants, the plural fellows, um, the uh, plural nurse, our um, uh, plural administrator, so uh, our secretary, um, in terms of arranging uh, follow-up appointments, procedures, th uh, procedural appointments, things like that, and um, a radiologist. And what about thoracic surgeons? So thoracic surgeons, um, if if we think a case, for example, requires input of a thoracic um, a surgeon, for example, um, in 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 some cases, well, actually, there there are usually two um, sorts of groups of patients. There's one which are straightforward, which are, for example, the um, lung cancer mesothelioma patients. Those will usually go via the lung and mesothelioma um, MDT, so they will form part from an oncological perspective. If, for example, we discuss a patient in in the plural MDT, for example, somebody with a pneumothorax with a persistent air leak, um, for example, or a difficult empyema that's not responding to chest tube drainage and intrapleural um, fibrolytic and enzyme therapy, who we want to discuss with the surgeon, then that we would make that decision together in the plural MDT. But then um, obviously one of us would then have to go and either refer to the thoracic surgeon or, or, or speak to them directly. But they do not form sort of a regular part of the plural MDT as such. Um, but from an oncology point of view, obviously, they have a regular um, regular presence there. So, you know, the plural service and the system that you all have there seems uh, very well oiled. And um, it's not very common in the United States to have that. I think only select centers could boast of uh, plural services like you describe uh, in the U.S. So just a couple of questions regarding that. The first is what kind of control do you have on the plural space? And and by that, I mean, is that does every empyema first come to you or is there always a, a coexistent thoracic consult placed by a general practitioner? So, uh, so sure. So the usually what happens is if a patient, for example, um, is suspected to have a pleural infection, then that will normally get raised to the respiratory registrars through the normal sort of respiratory referral system. And then that person will then usually he or she will then usually find one of us as a pleural consultant to discuss um, uh, the appropriateness of the antibiotic therapies that they're on, the other treatments, the likelihood of the diagnosis, the need for a chest strain and things like that and then they if they've performed the thoracic ultrasound we may have a look at the images with them we may go and see the patient with them but usually very early on the decision making would involve one of us as a plural specialist yes and how common is it to have uh, such a you know well-conducted and well-run plural service in the uk does every big university and institute have that yeah, so that, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, and and we've really, I think, in the last um, uh, decade, really seen a, a growth in plural services um, and thoracoscopy services around the country. Um, I think most most it would be safe to say that I think most regional units will usually have a named sort of plural lead, um, whether that's person, whether that's someone who's been uh, specifically plurally trained um i mean actually in most cases it'll probably be someone who's 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 got an interest who's sort of the named person um to kind of lead on the decision making as obviously the plural fellowships um out out with oxford and bristol there are a few other centers um around the country now that are also providing uh plural fellowships as you know kevin blythe's group in glasgow um leicester london um so a few other places but but until recently the plural fellowships um as a sort of specific dedicated training um where we're quite um we're quite niche so usually it will be a, a, a respiratory consultant with an interest who will who will sort of lead on the service within the institution i could discuss this with you for another hour i think but you know when <laughs> when i mentioned to people that i'm going to be interviewing a plural expert like you a lot of the demand was to discuss your approach to pleuroscopies so let for part two of this uh, podcast let's sort of switch gears and talk about your approach to pleuroscopies and what you do at your center. Let's start with the volume. So, you know, how many pleuroscopies do you all do in a month? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, I would say on average, we probably do about uh, two a week um, in our in our center. And I think that's kind of similar to, to what we used to do in, in Oxford as well, two or three a week. So usually I'd say about 10 to 12 a month. 
And then what about your technique? So are you guys administering sedation yourself or is the an anesthesiologist present? Yep. So I think most most places, so I know certainly us, Oxford and and I think Bristol are the same as well. We usually give the we usually use awake sedation. Um, but I know there are a couple of centers here and there that that have the luxury of a of a of an of an ETH test um with them who do it under under GA. But usually what we do, I mean I can obviously share our our practice, um, which is the same practice that I that I adopt here, which is what I used to do in, in Oxford, which we would give, um, we would start with a milligram of, of midazolam um, at the beginning um, of the procedure once we've gone through the safety checklists and all and all of that stuff, and then um, before we do the um, biopsies, we would administer um, intravenous fentanyl. And are these performed in an endoscopy procedure suite, or are they performed in the operating room? Yep. So in uh, so here we have a sort of a purpose built um, intervention suite, um, whereby you know we have uh, a sort of a a, a gowning area. We have um, a, a procedure a cabinet with all the equipment. We have a resource trolley. We have monitors and things like that. Um, in Oxford, we used to use a theater. Um, one of the so basically one of the theaters in the operating. Um, suite had a had a dedicated um, was was dedicated for respiratory intervention, so it was where we did all the bronchoscopy and all the plural work. Um, and I think most places will have one or the other um, of those um, uh, across the country. And I take it that same day discharge is uh, standard, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think unless we're um, unless there's any you know need to admit the patient, for example, a social reason, or for example, in 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 patients where we where we perform talk pudraj, um, then usually most um, cases would be a would be a day case. In every case that you administer talc, do you admit the patient? We do, yes. And if you do not administer talc, are you taking out the chest tube in the operating room or procedure suite, or are you taking it out in recovery? Yeah, so 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 I think most of the time, um, what we would do is we would um, we would put the chest tube in, we would put the patient in in recovery. Um, usually for thoracoscopy, the standard recovery time is about an hour, um, and then we would do a a chest X ray at the end of that, um, and then um, the, just to basically uh, ev evaluate whether the lung has, has come up or whether the the lung is trapped. And and as you know, you may get a feel of that um, during the thoracoscopy itself. Um, although there's not good data behind that, but you know, as as you know, things like you know, very uh, evident plural uh, visceral plural rind, or you know, very minimal diaphragmatic movement, things like that may give you a clue. Um, and then basically, if as long as there's no complications, there's no sub, um, subcutaneous emphysema, the patient's comfortable, um, no significant amounts of pain, etc. Um, then usually we would take the drain out at the end of that hour recovery period um, and let them go home with some simple uh, pain relief. Okay, and uh, let's get into a little more nitty gritty. How do you uh, approach a dry pleural space in case you need to do a biopsy? Okay. Yep. So, um, so uh, what we would do normally with these patients is we would um, would usually see them in clinic uh, first before they come to the um, intervention uh, suite or or theater. Um, and the reason for that is obviously they would need to have a careful ultrasound assessment first to to look for um, uh, absence or presence of lung sliding. Um, because obviously, if, uh, as you know, uh, Udit, if, 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 you know, that if there's no demonstrable lung sliding on ultrasound, then the chances of, of that, of the uh, pneumothorax induction um, using a Bhutan uh, needle being quite low. And, and obviously then we would, we would prefer to save the person the, you know, the, 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 the need to have to come for the procedure in the, in the, in the first place. Um, so, uh, so that would usually be how we would approach those. And then we would, if there is lung sliding, then we would carry out out a, a pneumothorax induction procedure uh, prior to the thoracoscopy. So the use of a Bhutan needle is pretty standard? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, this is a little bit of a rapid fire, okay? I'm going to get through all the questions that I've been asked to ask you. Yeah, so, no problem. Uh, so this is, this is another condition that you guys see a lot more than we do, mesothelioma. So yeah. in a suspected case, how is your approach different or is it different? Yeah, so that's a it's a really um, 
timely question and a really interesting one. So, and I think we're probably kind of starting to change gear a little bit here um, on the back of some of the uh, Glasgow data published um, recently that, that you may have seen. I think it was uh, in, in in lung cancer where they were obviously, I mean, A, obviously we know even before that data, we knew that the cytology from uh, in, in, in mesothelioma is very, very poor, around six to 10%. Um, and then in, uh, we, we know that in, in patients with, um, with, with asbestos exposure, um, uh, or where we suspect, um, mesothelioma either because we can see pleural plaques on the CT or because the patient uh, has an occupation and, and knows that they've had occupational asbestos exposure, that in those cases, there may be um, a rationale for proceeding direct to thoracoscopy. We, we've not we, we've not done that yet, um, but but certainly uh, I know one of my one of my colleagues is 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 looking at is is looking at a, a randomized um, a study or or a new part a new way of sort of changing the pathway to, uh, for example, rather than you know assessing everybody in the same way which we do which is to take some fluid off first and that's for cytology wait for the cytology and then decide on on having a local anesthetic thoracoscopy but rather in those patients where you have evidence of malignant uh, pleural thickening um, or asbestos exposure that those patients in those patients in that specific subgroup there may be merit in just proceeding um, direct to a local anesthetic thoracoscopy compared to the other compared to the other etiologies of of, of malignant pleural effusion yeah it's uh, sort of similar to what i do here i probably see only about three to four mesothelioma patients uh, a year uh, mm. but there's a lot more tb and in the intermediate tb risk patients as well as in the suspected mesothelioma patients we do a thoracoscopy first approach but i don't think yeah. this is standard of care uh, across the states either agreed uh, yeah uh, but what about, you know, you, you guys do a lot of research on mesothelioma. Is, is something like intrapleural therapies uh, uh, something that you'll factor in um, regularly or is, is that still very much in the research realm? Yeah, I think that's still very much in the research realm. Um, uh, as you know, the, uh, we we uh, we haven't. Um, there were some uh, vector uh, interferon um, studies. I think it was Trizel, I think the Trizel study that we were that we were taking part in. Um, uh, a few years ago, um, looking at administering um, uh, interferon via via an indwelling pleural catheter, um, but certainly it's 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 not it's not something that uh, that has breached standard of care and 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 or or being used in the clinical setting, um, at least in the UK um, and to, and to my knowledge, not in Europe. You know, you've mentioned there's uh, no standard of care. Let's go into an area where there is less evidence and more eminence and yeah. even more controversy. So what about pneumothorax recurrence prevention? Is that all done by a thoracic surgeon in your shop or are some patients falling to you to perform uh, talc insufflation? Yeah, so 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 usually um and this is um this is kind of UK practice in in general, um the most patients we would if if they've got um uh, where there's pneumothorax um recurrence would would go to a thoracic surgeon. Um, we wouldn't normally be involved in those patients um, unless um they have you know they're not surgical candidates um or you know there's uh, they, there's the, the frail person who you come on the ward who shows on there second or, or third pneumothorax and then you know that they, they haven't got a surgical option then we may try and use um, either ambulatory uh, Heimlich valves or um, or talc pleurodesis via chest tube or or in some cases blood patch um, pleurodesis as well um, but usually if there's any intervention um, I know there's there's some data on on sort of and uh, the bronchial interventions for these patients as well but but normally um, we we refer them to our surgeons. Just to clarify, this is you're talking about talc slurry and not insufflation during thoracoscopy, right? Yes, correct. So there is in your shop no role for a pulmonologist to uh, do a thoracoscopy in anyone with a recurrent pneumothorax. No, no, I know they do in Europe, um, in in some centres, um, but but in the UK we we don't know. I'm not aware of any centres doing this in the US either. I mean, there, there may be some, but the, the, there are some centres doing uh, what I'm going to ask you about next. So, what about pleuroscopy for empyema? Yes, yeah, the, that's a, it's a very topical one. It always comes up in the in the conferences and stuff. I so I think 
so we uh, so in the UK a few years ago we ran the the spirit um, study which was a feasibility study which uh, which was unfortunately was not a successful um, study um, because uh, it was ran from the ran by the uh, by by Rahul Batnagar and Maskell in Bristol and what they were looking to do was to assess the feasibility of of doing um, thoracoscopy in empyema patients but I think what it found was that in most centers because of the nature of how the thoracoscopy service was set up which in a nutshell basically because we were not able to or we don't have the capacity to deliver ad hoc thoracoscopy um you know on a, on at short notice you know when somebody comes through that it, that it wasn't going to be um, an appropriate option for us to do sort of to progress that to a randomized study looking at the role of thoracoscopy and empyema without you know causing potential significant delays in care and things like that so so generally that that was something that we so after the spirit study we kind of sort of draw a line um under under the concept of thoracoscopy for empyema um or at least for now is that again sort of standard of care across the uk correct yes so there's nobody in the uk who does thoracoscopy for 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 pleural infection yeah, I think in the US too, there's probably a handful of people who do that. Um, I mean, most uh, centers that do thoracoscopy do have sort of ad hoc access like I do, but there's also rapid access to a thoracic surgeon in an operating room. Correct. So we so we haven't uh, dwelled into that practice yet, but I know that people are doing it. And, and uh, in the absence of more evidence, I think that's something that we cannot call standard of care yet. Yeah, I, compl I would completely agree with that, Judith. 20 odd minutes of this podcast and we've covered a lot of material they have so any yeah. any closing thoughts anything you want to touch upon that we haven't spoken about no no it's been it's it's been great chatting actually i mean i, I guess one thing that um that i'd be interested to to know what what you guys do in um in terms of uh th thoracoscopy do most do most places do 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 rigid or or, or semi-rigid thoracoscopy so the semi-rigid scope has not been available in the u.s since 2019 I started okay. my plural service in 2019, so I got a semi-rigid scope. So mm. all my cases are both rigid and semi-rigid. I keep yeah. I keep both uh, ready to go in every case. I think that's the practice in every center that has both scopes. But the, okay. the issue with the newer programs is they don't have a semi-rigid scope available to them. So they have to be trained in rigid uh, pluroscopy. Yes. That, yeah, that's right. Most most places would use would use um rigid here, um and uh, and 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 just from from what I guess what I've discussed about the for, in terms of our UK approach to things, what would you say is one of the sort of the the big differences that stands out? Yeah, from the questions I asked you, uh, I think most people one take out the chest tube and recovery. I for one take it out uh, before they fully wake up in in the procedure suite, okay, um, and expect a little bit of you know pneumothorax ex vacuo after the procedure. Um, mm. <laughs> I mean, I, I put the chest tube to suction for a you know, few minutes, uh, suture, mm -hmm. and then, and then you know, take it out right there. But I think most people do what you do. I also yeah. feel, and again, this is my opinion, I might be wrong, that most people do have access to anesthesiologists. Uh, we also use a, a midazolam and fentanyl-based approach, but it's administered by an anesthesiologist and not by us, and occasionally a propofol-based approach, but not general anesthesia. I, I think... Uh, Apart from maybe, you know, I can count on one hand, uh, everybody approaches thoracoscopy with uh, sedation. Yeah. Uh, but not, not. Uh, I mean, the, the term local anesthesia thoracoscopy might be a little excessive. <laughs> it's probably yeah. more uh, unconscious sedation thoracoscopy. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And and would you do them as day cases as well or do you tend to admit most? No, no, day cases. Definitely day cases, day cases yeah. In okay. fact, we and do them do... at, we, we tend to do them at the end of the day because they recover quicker. <laughs> All our yes. bronchoscopies, or majority of our bronchoscopies, are under general anesthesia. Okay, and do you give antibiotics pre thoracoscopy? Uh, we give, uh, yes, we give cefazolin, um, yeah. prophylaxis, unless they have a penicillin allergy. Uh, yeah. Again, as you know, uh, evidence is <laughs> very poor, but that's yes. my practice. Uh, I think that's the practice in most centers. I cannot speak for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, that's exactly what we do. But I think there's the only the the one perspective study, I think the only randomized study, I think, I uh, can't remember who the first author was, I think it was Duria. Um, I think it was published in Respiration. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. The, yeah, it was actually the PGI group in India. Yeah, but I think we all just feel a bit better uh, <laughs> giving that dose of antibiotic. Absolutely. All right, Ihav, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Yeah, likewise. Uh, thank you for having me. Um,